Shalom and welcome to the 10th lecture in the Ghetto Fighters House International Virtual Lecture Series, Talking Memory. My name is Medin Shachar and I am an educator and a guide at the Ghetto Fighters House. First of all, I would like to thank the Durfner Foundation for supporting this lecture series and helping the museum to bring such knowledgeable speakers since this past August to over 3,000 participants from over 25 countries. We thank everyone for their support. And if you would like to make a donation to help keep programs like Talking Memory available to the general public, there will be a link to our website with details in the chat box. And also I'd like to remind everyone that uh, tonight's talk is based on Glenn Kurtz's uh, research on his book, Three Minutes in Poland, Discovering a Lost World in a 1938 family film uh, from the publishing house of Farrar, Strauss and Giraud, 2014. For those of you who have not read the book, and I highly recommend reading the book, we will post a link to Glenn's website with more information about the book and how you can order it online in our chat box. And before introducing our distinguished guest, I would like to invite the CEO of the Ghetto Fighters House, Mr. Egal Cohen, to say a few words. Egal. Shalom to everyone and welcome to our last event for 2020. The lecture, the lecture series, Token Memory, was born out of the circumstances created by the global pandemic that we all still experiencing. Here in Israel, museums and public institutions were closed for a long time and then reopened on and off. At the very beginning of this unbelievable forced lockdown, we at the Ghetto Fighters House understood that we must reinvent ourselves. We plan in no time numerous online activities for different audiences in Israel and abroad, which were received with great interest and many participants from around the world. But above, but above all I see the, taken, the token memories lecture series as the jewel in the crown of this unforgettable period. We had hundreds of participants joining us every month from South Africa, the US, Europe, and Israel actually, from every continent. And for that, I'm deeply grateful and proud. Firstly, I'm thankful for our dedicated team, Beiden Shachar, who organized and runs the program, Dr. Tamir Hod, who advised along the way, Sharon Steinbaum, who made the connection with our international supporters, especially the Daphne Foundation that supported the Talking Memory series from the start. Ron Cohen, who has served as the man behind the scenes on every program and edited all the video recordings from our YouTube channel and the Thai bar was on marketing. This was all made possible thanks to the many inspiring lecturers who gave their time and exp expertise to the Ghetto Fighters Hour series. But above all, I would like to thank all of you, our loyal audience, for your interest and commitment. We have planned a very interesting program for, for 2021 and hope to continue seeing all of you with us throughout next year as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Egal. And I have to say that this project is definitely the ultimate proof that it takes a village. This is true concerning our wonderful staff here at the Ghetto Fighters House, so much support. And also true when it comes to all the wonderful speakers that we've been able to bring to our global audience. And of course, like you said, Egal, the audience, the loyal audience that comes back again and again and again, and also our new friends that come to listen to our program. And now I would like to introduce our guest today, Glenn Kurtz. So as we all know, and that's why we're here tonight, Glenn Kurtz is the author of Three Minutes in Poland, Discovering a Lost World in a 1938 Family Film. It was named a best book of 2014 when it came out by The New Yorker and the Boston Globe and the National Public Radio. The Los Angeles Times called the book breathtaking. I agree, it is definitely breathtaking from page to page. 
and has received high critical praise in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Chicago Tribune, and many other publications. A Dutch translation appeared in 2015, and a documentary film based on the book and the research will be released in early 2020. So Glenn, please keep us uh, uh, updated when this will happen. Glenn's first book, Practicing a Musician's Return to Music, that was published by Alfred A. Knopf in 2007, also received enthusiastic reviews from the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, and elsewhere. And like I said, I'm putting up a link for Glenn's website so you can read more about his uh, work. A frequent public speaker, Glenn has presented keynote addresses at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, the Rogers Center for Holocaust Education, Chapman University in Orange, California, the Virginia Holocaust Museum in Richmond, the University of California, Santa Barbara, the Jewish Historical Museum in Amsterdam, the Weiner Library, and the Polish Museum of History of po Polish Jews, and now at the Ghetto Fighters House in virtual Israel. Glenn is a 2019-2022 Presidential Fellow at Chapman University, Orange, in California, and the recipient of a 2016-17 John Simon Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. A graduate of Tufts University and the New England Conservatory of Music, he holds a PhD from Stanford University in German Studies and Comparative Literature. He has taught at Stanford University, San Francisco State University, and is currently on the faculty at the Gallatin School of Individualized Study at New York University. He lives in New York City, my favorite city, and has just completed a novel and a book of nonfiction, both about the Empire State Building, my favorite building. <laughs> so Glenn, for sure, uh, we're looking for those as well. Glenn, we are so happy to have you here today as our 10th speaker to close the 2020 Talking Memory Program. Welcome, Glenn. Thank you, Medine. It's really a pleasure to be here and it's an honor to be here. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank Egal Cohen. I want to thank Ron Cohen, who I met when I was, uh, when I visited during my research in 2012. Um, you've had such extraordinary speakers, Samuel Cassow, David Morwell, my friends, Michal Deckel and Marissa Fox. Um, so I am yeah. tremendously honored to, uh, to be the final speaker in this year's series. Um, thank you. Um, as so many stories um, about the war period and the Holocaust these days, this is a story about grandparents, or it begins with my grandparents. Um, and well, it's still not working. Um, in a moment, you'll see <laughs> an image of, uh, of my grandparents, David and Lisa Kurtz, um, both of whom were born in Poland in the 1880s and came to the United States as small children with their families um, in the 1890s. So they very much uh, identified as Americans. Um, and so our part in this story is, is an American story. Um, and as it was fairly common for, um, for people of that generation, the, the sort of parents, the immigrants themselves had a, a harder time uh, adapting to the, um, to the new world. Ah, here my grandparents. <laughs> um, the older generation had a harder time adapting to, to the new world and it fell really to the children generation um, to establish themselves, to assimilate to American culture and to in fact become Americans. And my grandparents were very proud Americans. Um, they, uh, my grandfather left school uh, in the ninth grade and uh, started to um, support, help support his family. Uh, my grandmother also worked in a shop in her early years. They met and married in 1912. And by the mid-1930s, they had established themselves um, and um, began to travel. Here's a lovely picture of them from, from 1937. I, I should Glenn, say that I never- Before you continue, hi, I'm sorry I'm bothering you. That's um, okay. You, don't, you can put the microphone down because we hear okay. you fine. Ex perfect. Okay, sorry. Um, I should say that I never, I never met my grandfather who died before I was born. Um, and my grandmother, although she lived to uh, uh, an old age, um, was of, again, of that sort of generation, which was not really that interested in sharing memories of the old country. Um, if you asked her, you know, what was it like when you were little, she would say, why would you want to know? She was most proud of having become an American. And she was not uh, the kind of grandmother to gather the grandchildren around her knees and tell long 
stories about, uh, about the old days. So it was a tremendous surprise to me when in 2009, um, rummaging around in my grandparent in my parents' closet in Florida, I came across this home movie. Uh, it was something that I guess I had known that we had had, maybe watched it a few times when I was a child, but it had languished and kind of fallen into um, forgetfulness. It says, our trip to Holland, Belgium, Poland, Switzerland, France, and England, 1938. And here you see my grandmother and three of their friends, Louis Molina, uh, Mr. Molina's sister, Essie Diamond, and uh, Mr. Molina's wife, uh, Rosie Molina, um, enjoying a, a trip across the ocean. When I saw this film for the first time as an adult, everything that I knew about it was contained in that title. It was a trip, it went to those countries, and it was in 1938. But simply seeing the words Poland and 1938 together in a sentence um, alerted me that this was something of tremendous value and something that was significant and, would, and was deserving of attention. So I wanted to understand more about it. The film in itself is 14 minutes long, and it's like everybody else's home movies of their vacations. That was them in, in Holland and then in Belgium. Here they are in Switzerland. The majority of the film, here's the south of France. The majority of the film features my grandparents and their friends waving at the camera here in Paris and standing in front of famous monuments and um, basically saying, here we are, which is what people say uh, it, with their photographs of themselves at tourist attractions, having achieved a certain status in America and having uh, achieved the resources to be able to travel. Really, they were primarily proud to be able to take this kind of a trip. And the film, for the most part, documents that. In the middle of it, however, there are three minutes which are strikingly different. And those are the three minutes shot in Poland. And I'll play them now. Of course, it's a silent film. And my grandfather was a very amateur filmmaker, so some of the shots are difficult to see. Although this is interesting because interiors from this era are very unusual. But rather than my grandparents being the focus of the camera, now my grandfather is the focus because he has a camera. And you see the commotion that's created in this town by the presence of an American with a camera. And one of the most remarkable things about the film is that two thirds of it are in color.
and that's it. It's just three minutes long. And because there's no sound and because I knew nothing about it, it's a terribly enigmatic few minutes of film. Um, but of course, the first time I watched it, it's, it's terribly, terribly poignant because of what we know that the people in the film don't know, which is the future and how terribly short and violent the future was going to be. Um, I didn't know what town it was. I didn't know where or why my grandparents had gone. But just seeing the, in, the detail and the, the sort of individuality of the people in the film made me want to be able to understand what it was that I was looking at. Now, even without knowing where the film is or who the people are in person. The film itself as a historical document is tremendously valuable. It has kinds of detail that you can't get from photographs and from uh, documents. You see details of people's clothing, you see how they move, you see the social interactions of people on the street, how often they shove each other and the ways in which they relate to each other and point to the camera. There's a tremendous amount of information you can learn a great deal about the culture. You can, in fact, in this still, if you can see my cursor, you can see that there's a mezuzah here on the door frame. There's a lot of information in the frame that can be unpacked even without knowing precisely where it is. But of course, knowing precisely where it is and above all, precisely who it is was the thing that most motivated me. And naturally I asked my father and my, my aunt, um, if they knew, and they said that it was my grandmother's hometown, and I was able to find a survivor from, from that town, Berezna, on the far eastern edge of Poland at the time. Now it's in the Ukraine. And I showed him the film, and within a second he said, it's not my town, I've never seen it before. So the family history that came down with the film was, was not accurate. There's a lot of other towns in Poland. I guessed if it wasn't my grandmother's hometown, then probably it was my grandfather's hometown. Um, and my sister, who's done enormous genealogical research and is with us today, um, has had found the, the name of the town and a lot of information about the town. So we knew the name of my grandfather's town. But despite a tremendous amount of work and research, I was unable to find a survivor who was able to help me understand what the images that I was looking at meant, what it was that we were seeing. I did find one survivor, Susan Weiss, born Hesia Eisenberg, but she was born in 1932. She was six years old when my grandparents visited, seven when the war began, and only 13 years old when the war ended. And she was the sole survivor of a family of nine. She was able to come to the United States at age 15, and she decided at that time that her life was going to begin again. And she spent the next 70 years forgetting the first part of her life. And when I met her in her 70s, she had just begun to try to remember, but it was for her a, a struggle to remember and not to remember because the memories of course were so painful. And she, in looking at the film, was not even able to identify the town where she was born. So I was at loose ends. I went to libraries and uh, archives, of course, the YIVO archive in New York City, the Joint Distribution Committee archive, and it's possible to find a great deal of information, the business records from uh, the business uh, directory of the town from 1929, I found uh, correspondence from the Landsmannschaft uh, in, in New York uh, with lists of uh, committees who were entitled to distribute money that was being sent from the United States uh, to aid the poor in, in this town. A lot of names, but to bridge the gap from names to faces was a step beyond what research can do. The one thing that I was able to do, and for this I have the Ghetto Fighters House to thank, in their archive, thanks to Tzvi Oren, who I met when I was there in 2012, there are a handful of photographs that are labeled Nashelsk. They were donated anonymously. A few have names associated with them, but for my purposes, the one that was most important here on the right was a photograph labeled Nashelsk Synagogue Doors. And as you can see in the upper left panel of that door, there's a carved lion, and that lion matches exactly the lion 
which you can see in the upper left panel of the door in the still from my grandfather's film. So it was thanks to the Ghetto Fighters House that I was able finally to confirm that the town in the film is my grandfather's hometown of Nashalsk, Poland. Well, once you have the name, it's possible to learn a great deal of general information about the town. The Shelsk's about uh, 50 kilometers north of Warsaw. Uh, the Jewish population uh, settled there probably in the late 15th or early 16th century. By the 17th century, it had a, a real presence. And by the middle of the 18th century, it was established enough to have built a large and famous wooden synagogue. Uh, reputed to be one of the most beautiful synagogues in all of Poland. And that synagogue stood for more than 150 years. Uh, it was torn down in the 1880s and replaced by the uh, brick and iron synagogue that you see in my grandfather's film. By 1900, the town had a population of about 5,000, approximately half of which was, was Jewish. And by 1938, approximately 7,500 residents of whom uh, slightly more than 3,000 were Jewish. There was a railway connection nearby, which uh, um, enabled uh, easy transportation back and forth to the capital. And it was a thriving, if poor, town um, in the way of Polish shtetls of that, of that era. And it's different, I think, than we often imagine. It's not sort of the, the dirt streets Anatevka that Americans think of when they hear the word shtetl. Um, by the time my grandparents visited, this was a town on the cusp of modernity. Some of the delivery people here you see in the upper right had, uh, had uh, uh, trucks, not just uh, horses and wagons. You can see in this um, uh, image of the sort of uh, important members of the town that there's a, a fairly wide representation of sort of different orientations towards Jewish culture. You have Orthodox, you have more secular Jews, you have professional Jews, and of course, tradesmen. It was a town with a great deal of culture. In the bottom, you see there were uh, uh, at least one, possibly two amateur theater companies. People in town had telephones. It was a town that was just becoming modern in the way that we would recognize. Of course, all of that ended in September 1939. Um, on September 1st, the German army invaded Poland, and because of the town's proximity to the capital and that railway line, it was occupied almost immediately. By September 3rd, 1939, the town was in German hands. And immediately, the Jewish population was targeted. Um, the synagogue was desecrated, the Torah scrolls were burned in the marketplace, stores were looted, women were raped, Men were seized on the streets and would have their beards shaved off or would be thrown into trucks and transported someplace for forced labor. By the end of October 1939, the territory that contained Nashelsk was annexed to Germany. It became part of the German Reich. And at the end of October of 1939, Heinrich Himmler issued an order saying that by the end of the year, all Jews had to be expelled from these annexed territories. So it was barely three months after the Germans arrived on December 3rd, 1939, that the entire Jewish population in Nashelsk was gathered in the marketplace. A small group was sent immediately to the train station to a deportation train. The remainder were confined in the synagogue overnight, where there were these beautiful hand-painted murals on the walls, which they were forced to scrape off with their fingernails. The following morning, they were also loaded onto a deportation train. And for the next three or four days, they were shunted around different rail lines in Poland. It was only December 1939. There were no ghettos in Poland yet. There were no concentration camps in Poland yet. I think that the German authorities didn't really know what they wanted to do with these refugees, except get rid of them somehow. So after several days in this train, eventually they were um, sent to two towns in central Poland in what became the general government, Lukov and Mizerich, where they arrived as refugees and were received as best as possible by the local population. Now, again, there were no walls around these ghettos, uh, around these towns. Those who had uh, connections 
or relatives elsewhere were able to move around. And so the population dispersed somewhat. But eventually, both Lukov and Mizrich became what were called transit ghettos. And they were tightly, tightly controlled and filled with uh, Jews from all over Poland. Eventually, along with approximately 10,000 other Jews in August of 1942, the entire population of both of those ghettos were put on trains, transported to Treblinka, and murdered on arrival. By the end of the war, of the 3,000 Jews who had lived in Nashalsk when my grandparents visited, fewer than 100 were still alive. And that was in 1945. I found the film in 2009. So even under the best of circumstances, it would have been unlikely for me to find someone who would be able to help me understand the images that I was looking at. For more than two and a half years, I did research and I gathered enormous amount of documentation about the town of Nashalk. But as I said before, this, this gap between names on a page and faces in the film was for me unbridgeable. And then two and a half years after I started searching, I got an email from a woman in Detroit, Marcy Rosen, who I believe is with us today. And she saw the film online. Ah, I hope that it's still playing. And in this scene where the camera pans across the faces of the children in the marketplace, ah, the film keeps pausing. I'm going to leap it. And there we are. One face leapt out at her. And that's her grandfather, who is also with us today. Here, in 1938, 13-year-old Moshek Tuchhendler, born in 1924, the middle of, of three sons of, of uh, Shaya and Chava Tuchhendler. And here on the right, now in America, Maurice Chandler, holding his first great-grandchild. Well, I spoke with Mr. Chandler on the phone <clears throat> that night, um, really a few minutes after he saw the film for the first time. And the first thing that he said to me was, you've given me back my childhood. And I think like many survivors, the events of the war and the trauma of survival so overshadowed what had come before that his early childhood seemed almost like a dream, like something that was inaccessible. And here in this film, he appears before anything had happened. For my part, if I was going to meet one person who was going to be my guide to the film that my grandfather had taken, it would be Maurice Chandler. He has a photographic memory. He was able to identify people in the film, remember names, dates, places, to tell stories about their lives, about people important to the town who didn't happen to appear in the film. And from the information that he was able to provide and with the research that I had done, eventually it became possible to tell the kind of detailed story that matched the extraordinary detail that we can see in these moving images. So what I'd like to do with um, the remainder of my time tonight is to share with you some of the ways in which this information became possible to link up and the way that fragments from all different places, all different sort of media and all different people connected in these very, very unexpected ways and allowed me to tell at least a fragmentary story of some of the people who appear in my grandfather's film. So I'll play for you a very brief uh, clip from one of uh, the many interviews that uh, Mr. Chandler and I conducted. Okay, here are these two people. And we have better pictures of them coming up later. Yes, but yes. The, the man with the white beard, yeah, the man with the white beard, I think he was sort of the, uh, what they called, what they called the ascetic person. Mm -hmm. His name, everybody knew him by one name. His name was Cheskaya. Cheskaya. 
Cheskia is a biblical from the Tanakh. Nobody knew what he lived of. Mm. But he was dressed just like that with that beard. And everybody fed him. He would walk into everybody's house. <clears throat> I remember he used to eat chopped liver with strong onions. And you knew he was coming before. <laughs> you know, black bread, this and that, very simple life. And everybody thought he was, you know, the Jewish version of sainthood. Yeah. Like a know. mystic? Heskia. He would go from yeah, yeah. different houses like the, the Bornsteins when we used to be there. He would come up and he tells, told stories from the past and so on. And then he'd leave. Nobody knew where he slept. Hmm. Probably in the shul or something. He was that type of a character. Hmm. Now, the men, the shorter men, with the black beard. Yeah, black beard. his name is Hamnusen Zweighaft. And he was the one they called him the Matsaiva Kritzer. He was the one that chiseled all the uh, uh, headstones, headstones for the cemetery. Well, you can hear the texture and the quality of Mr. Chandler's extraordinary memory. And with information like that, as I say, it became possible to tell a story about my grandfather's film that otherwise simply would not have been possible. Um, and I'll share with you some of the ways in which this information developed. Eventually, we were able to locate seven living survivors from Nashelsk and to interview them and gather their stories. So one of the people Mr. Chandler introduced me to was a man named Kiva Richman. Um, Kiva's family had uh, left Poland in August 1939. Um, Kiva was only three years old, so he had no memory of it. Um, but his family brought with them a photo album. And um, I was able to look at this photo album. Kiva didn't know any of the people, of course, but his mother very fortunately had labeled these images. And at this time, I, I had no idea who... I was going to be looking for, there were 3,000 people, any of them could be important, any of them could appear in the film. I had to remember all of the names and collect all of the documentation and hope that at some point in the future this information would become useful. And indeed, that was the case. So uh, a year later, when I was in Israel um, and I was able to connect with other descendants of Nashalsk, including Yaniv Goldberg, who's here with us also tonight. Um, and we went to Kiryat Ono, which in the post-war period, the American Landsmannschaft, the Nashalsk Society, had uh, raised money to build a, a small apartment building for some of the survivors from Nashalsk who had emigrated to Israel. And that, of course, still exists today. And we went more or less from door to door to find out if there were any living survivors still from Nashalsk. And we knocked on the door of one gentleman named Michal Koprak. Now, it happened that we caught him just as he was on his way out to a doctor's appointment and he didn't want to talk to us. Uh, but when uh, I heard his name, I remembered a photograph from Kiva Richmond's photo album. And we just had a moment and I pulled up that photograph and showed it to him. And from a hurried, elderly, somewhat sickly man, he transformed in front of me into like a six-year-old child and he was grabbing my arm. The man in the photograph is his father and he didn't have any photographs of his father. And so this was the first time that Mikhail had seen his father's face since he had escaped from Nashelsk in October of 1939. And in fact, if you look at the two photographs, the faces, it could be the same person. They're, they're practically the same. Um, so he canceled his doctor's appointment and spent the next uh, hour or so talking with us and watching the film and sharing his recollections. Um, and Again, it was characteristic of this story that information from one survivor would connect in odd and unexpected ways with information from another. So that when the film um, reached that moment in which Chaim Nusen Zweighaft, the Matsaiva Kritzer, the gravestone chiseler, um, appeared, Mr. Koprak pointed and said, him, I remember him. He didn't remember his name, but when I said the name, he said, yes, I remember. His workshop was right near the yeshiva. And uh, Mr. Koprak said every day after school, the boys had been sort of cooped up all day long. They would go to this workshop where there were, of course, all sorts of stone chips lying on the ground and they would have rock fights. 
Now, needless to say, this would annoy Mr. Zweighaft, who would try to get rid of them. And, and what Mr. Karprock said was he would threaten us by saying he was going to give our names to the angel of death. And they figured because of his connection to the, because of his profession, he had a good connection to the angel. And this threat was very effective and the boys would scatter. I bring this up because now not only is there a face in the film and a name, but we have this, this little anecdote, this moment, momentary slice of life, which probably Mr. Kuprock had never shared with anyone. Who, who else would care? And yet because of my grandfather's film, because of Marcy Rosen recognizing her grandfather, because of Mr. Chandler being able to provide the name, and because of the uh, connections that we were able to establish with Mr. Koprock, this little piece of memory and this little portrait of this man has been preserved. Well, it turns out that Chaim Nussen Zweikhoff was a pretty important guy in town. On the left here is in my grandfather's film, and here in another photograph from Kiva Richmond's family album. Now, it turns out that this photograph is the committee of, uh, who was entitled to distribute money raised by the American Landsmannschaft to the needy in Nashelsk. In fact, it was the people whose names appeared in one of the documents that I'd found from the YIVO Institute. So it became possible to identify all of the men in this other photograph. Um, if you can see my cursor here on the upper right, I'll point out one in particular, Fischl Perlmutter, who was the town photographer, and also the artist who had painted the murals in the synagogue that were destroyed on the day of the deportation. In the center, of course, you see Chaim Nussen Zweikhoft. And then again, characteristic of this story that I never knew whose name was going to be important. And in fact, the people who get remembered are the people who happen by accident or circumstance to show up in documents that happen to survive. And so I'll point out here in the lower left, this gentleman. Chaim Huberman. Well, among the documents that we found uh, here from the um, Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw, from the Ringelblum archive, there are only a handful of documents that uh, mention Nashelsk, including this one, which is um, simply the protocol of a meeting that took place at the end of December 1939, um, uh, documenting the formation of a committee to aid the Jewish refugees deported to Lukov. Lukov. Well, it's a very typical memo. It simply says what happened and who was there among the people who was there. Here, if you can see the cursor, the third signature, Chaim Huberman. Well, this document is very important for a number of reasons. First of all, in addition to adding a little bit of definition to Chaim Huberman's life, it also shows us that three weeks after the deportation, the community was still trying to function as a community. They were trying to help themselves. They were trying to form a committee to gather aid for those in the greatest need. It's not clear exactly who this memo was sent to. Nevertheless, it's an important um, sort of insight into what the community was like in these weeks immediately following the deportation. Now, I should say just as a, an aside that the discovery of the Ringelblum archive, that absolutely invaluable resource for understanding the um, uh, Jewish life during the German occupation, um, that one of the Nashelsk survivors that I met, Andrzej Lubanetsky, was present at the discovery of the first cache of documents. Um, this is a photograph taken probably just a few minutes after the most famous um, photograph in, in which uh, um, Herr Schwasser, uh, who's standing here in the center uh, behind Mr. Lubanetsky, um, is receiving the first uh, cache of documents from Michal Borvich who is here um, on the left. Um, Mr. Lubanetsky was a little bit older. He had been in the Polish army. He had been captured by the Germans. He had escaped from captivity, fled to the East, and in 1946 was back in Warsaw with his family and became friends with Herr Schwasser and was present on the day of the discovery of the first group of documents from the Ringelblum archive. As I say, there's only a handful of documents that mention the Shelsk. One of them is the, an eyewitness account of the deportation. Um, and another 
provides information about Chaim Huberman. In fact, it's a document that's not about Nashelsk at all. It's about conditions of uh, refugees in the Lublin district. But there's a PS at the bottom of this one note, and it says, we regret to inform you that our friend, the counselor from Nashelsk, Chaim Huberman, was shot by the Germans for giving aid to Russian soldiers, Russian prisoners of war. From that document, I'm able to determine the precise date and manner of Chaim Huberman's death. Of all of the Nashelsk Jews who perished in the Holocaust, Mr. Huberman is the only one for whom I can provide documentation for the precise day and date of his death. Another person Mr. Chandler recognized in my grandfather's film was this young man with the beard here, and he remembered the name Kubel. Well, as I mentioned, my sister was uh, inv deeply involved in Jewish genealogy. In fact, she was the president of the Jewish Genealogical Society of the San Francisco Bay Area, and as such had uh, access to the archives of the Jewish Genealogical Society. And so when we started researching Nashelsk, we went back into these archives, 20 years worth of emails in which people post uh, the family names that they're looking for and the towns that they're interested in. And there from 1996 was an email from someone looking for the family Kubel from Nashelsk. It was more than 13 years later that I responded to that email. And amazingly, the woman, Faith Olstein, responded. And she sent me this photograph. The Kubel family in Nashelsk. And there you can see in the upper left, the same young man who appears in my grandfather's film. Well, uh, Faith, who uh, sent me this photograph, is the daughter of Sura Kubel, who's standing in the upper right in the plaid suit. Um, it was a family of five sisters and one brother, Avram, the youngest, and the other gentleman standing there is the husband of the eldest sister, Shandal, who's sitting in the center. Sura came to the United States in 1938, and she was the only survivor of her family. And like many sole survivors, it was extremely painful for her to speak about her lost family, and so her children, Faith Olstein and Jerry Goldsmith, did not even know the names of their aunts and uncles in Nashalsk. But at Sura's death, Jerry Goldsmith, Sura's son, found a collection of photographs and letters from the sisters to Sura in the United States. And this cache of documents proved to be an extraordinary record of their life from 1938 until early 1942 from the Warsaw Ghetto. Among those documents was this photograph, which Jerry had not even recognized was the same family. And I'll go back between the two in a second. But this is just two years later from a letter associated with uh, probably in the beginning of 19, uh, the end of 1940 or early 1941. Obviously, the men have shaved their beards, most likely to appear less conspicuously Jewish. But here, I want to point out just the transformation in their faces. If you look here in the center, you see Shandl sitting quite self-assured. And she's moved to the right of, this, of the photograph in the next. To me, this transformation is one of the most haunting documents that I found in my search, the, the haunted, indeed hunted expression on her face um, tells as much as any of the letters. As I mentioned, this archive, this collection of documents was a tremendous, um, uh, of tremendous importance. Among other photographs was this one, um, and naturally, of course, every time I found something new, I would share it with all of the survivors that I was in touch with. And when I showed this to Mr. Chandler, he was amazed. And he was amazed for any number of reasons. First, here he is himself, once again, sitting in the front and center. He recognized it immediately as having been taken in his family's workshop. They had a, uh, a ready-to-wear clothing store, and this was where the clothes were made. And then you can see, in fact, on the wall in the back, the designs for the fashions for spring 1939. Um, but what was most important 
was the presence of his family members. Here, if you can see my cursor, was his cousin, Elia Applebaum, who was the designer and had most likely drawn those designs for the clothing. Here is Mr. Chandler's older brother, Avram. Below him, his younger brother, David. And here on the far right is Mr. Chandler's father. This is the closest thing that he had to a family photograph. With his help and with the help of the other survivors, it became possible to identify the majority of people in this photograph. And even when Maury and I talk today, he always says he, he knows all of their names. And um, over the years, uh, new names have continued to come to him. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to identify more as time goes on. Of course, I became extremely interested in the Kubel family and Sura's um, survival. I was able to find her manifest when she arrived in the United States in November of 1938. And here is detail. You can see Kubel, Sura. She's 26 years old, female, single. Her profession is given as a corset maker. From Nashalsk, her closest contact in Nashalsk is her sister, Ruchla. And the big surprise for me here at the bottom, her contact in the United States, cousin, Louis Molina, my grandfather's friend, who accompanied them on their trip and who you saw in that first clip of my grandparents crossing the ocean. So it was from this document that for the first time I had some inkling of what my grandparents had done during their time in Nashalsk. Sarah Kubel emigrates just three months after my grandparents' visit. Almost certainly she met, the Kubel family must have met with uh, my grandparents and with the Molinas, and had conversations about emigrating to the United States. So in this very unusual and unexpected way, I received just a little bit of information about what my grandparents had done during their visit to Nashalsk. When they returned on Labor Day, September 5th, 1938, to New York, I think that what they thought they had in their in their luggage was a tourist film, a document just like all of us will take of any of our travels of no particular importance to anybody except the family. And yet, as a result of this film, it became possible to document and to tell the story of this town that was so uh, decimated in, in the war and to give definition and individuality to some of the people who appear in my grandfather's film. Of course, a story like this continues to develop long after um, I write the book and, uh, and publish what, what I had been able to find and the stories that I'd been able to collect. In 2014, when I realized that it was the 75th anniversary of the deportation, I reached out to the community of people that had uh, gathered as a result of this research, of course, the survivors and their family, family members um, <coughs> of survivors who were no longer living, and others like myself, descendants who traced their ancestry to Nashalsk. And I suggested that we go back to the town to commemorate this anniversary of the deportation. And it was going to be in October, and I didn't really expect that very many people would want to go to Poland at the end of October. Nevertheless, more than 50 people agreed to come. And here we are standing on that same street where my grandfather had filmed the children jumping up and down and waving in front of the camera. It was an extraordinary visit. We were met by the mayor and greeted warmly by the town. Um, we were extremely fortunate to have one of the survivors, Leslie Glodek, and his family with us. And we met with a group of high school students in the Nashelsk High School. Well, as it turns out, the Nashelsk High School is located in the building that was formerly the yeshiva. And so Leslie Glodek was able to speak to students who were the same age he was when he had to flee Nashal in the same building where he himself had been a student. It was for him an extraordinary visit to be received warmly by this community. And um, it was for all of the students, I believe, uh, a way to make personal the events that had taken place in in their town, in the very building where they were sitting. And I'll speak just a little bit now to explain this final photograph. 
Um, here you see Mr. Chandler's daughter, Evelyn, who's also with us today, and her husband, Steve Rosen. And they're standing with two young Poles, Martina and Adam Dudkevich. I didn't speak about how Mr. Chandler survived the war. Uh, it's a long story. I'll give just a very, very quick um, summary of it. He had been in the Warsaw Ghetto with his family. And in May of 1941, he, his older brother, and three other boys from Nashelsk escaped. And they escaped in the simplest way possible. They jumped on the streetcar. If you know of the way in which the Warsaw Ghetto was situated, it was occupied something like the center of the town. And public transportation, for at least a period of time, continued to run through the middle of the town. There would be a a Polish conductor on the steps preventing people from getting on and getting off and German guards on the, uh, at the entrance to the ghetto and at the exit to the ghetto to check people's papers. But Mr. Chandler learned that it was possible to bribe the Polish conductor and he, his brother, and these three other boys did so and got on. Of course, for the conductor, it was no big deal because the German soldiers on the opposite end would almost certainly just come on board, check people's papers, identify the stowaways, and they would be shot. But for whatever reason, on that day, Mr. Chandler says that the weather was very inclement, it was cold, and the German guard, instead of coming on to the, tr the tram, simply walked around it and then sent it on its way. And so the five boys were out of the ghetto. Of course, the first thing that happened is that they were assaulted by the Schmaltzovniks, these gangs of bandits who would attack um, and prey on uh, Jewish escapees. They made their way, however, out into the countryside, and eventually Mr. Chandler and his brother um, got jobs on farms um, in, in an area sort of east of the capital. The other three boys, after a few weeks of that life, decided that this was not for them, and they all went back to the ghetto, and none of them survived. During the winter of 1941 to 42, a typhus epidemic raged throughout Poland. And during that time, Mr. Chandler's older brother, Avram, died and he was left alone. He was working at the farm of a Polish woman named Helena Jagodzinska. And he stayed there for uh, about nine months until the spring of 1942, when the order came down that everyone now had to collect in ghettos, this in preparation for Operation Reinhardt. And the night before Mr. Chandler was going to leave, Helena asked him, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I've run out of options. I'll, I'll have to go to a ghetto. And she said, you're not going to go to a ghetto. That night, her nephew, Stanislav Pachnik, who worked at the County Hall of Records, arrived with a stolen birth certificate. They coached Mr. Chandler in his new name. They said, try to be this person. And they sent him on his way. Well, of course, to survive in German-occupied Poland, a birth certificate was an important document, but it was hardly a guarantee of success. You needed a great deal more in order to survive. The story of that survival is in the book. Um, I'm not going to go into the details here now. Suffice it to say that Mr. Chandler did survive. And eventually he came to the United States. Seventy years went by. And then one day he's on the phone with some stranger whose grandfather had gone to Nashelsk in 1938 and shown and, and captured Mr. Chandler as a boy on film. So we had a meeting and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum documented that meeting and they made a little video about, our, about my grandfather's film and about this way that these two families had been reconnected as a result of it. And that film got picked up by Polish television news. And at the end of 2012, it was shown on um, uh, TVN24, this popular news program in Poland, and Helena Jagodzinska's daughter, now in her 80s, saw it and recognized Mr. Chandler as the boy her mother had helped during the war. And a few weeks later, her granddaughter, Helena's great-granddaughter, Martina Dudkevich, emailed me on Facebook <laughs> And she said, well, when Mr. Chandler left my great-grandmother's farm in 1942, he left behind a group of photographs, and we still have them, and we would like to return them. And indeed, they did. And this was the opportunity for Mr. Chandler's family to meet with the Dudkevich family. And indeed, uh, two years ago, they came to the United States 
and had a chance to meet Mr. Chandler personally. Two years later, Helena Jagodzinska and Stanislav Pachnik were named Righteous Among the Nations. And here is Martina and her grandmother, Mr. Chandler's family and, uh, and Helena's family at the Nozick Synagogue in Warsaw. The ways in which my grandfather's films spread out and created this network, which had all of these chance encounters and un unexpected connections shows, I think, the way in which the town itself was connected. A small town is a system of networks. And if you tap into them, and if you pull on one thread in them, they lead to many others. I never imagined when I found the film that it would be possible to uh, identify as many people as we did and to tell the stories in the detail that I have. But with Mr. Chandler's help and with the help of the other survivors, it became possible. So thank you very much. And then I'd uh, be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Glenn, for telling your story, your family's story, and also the story of many uh, uh, of the families of the survivors. Um, actually, not that we have uh, questions, but we actually have uh, comments from people who are connected. I don't know how you say it, the Neshakliers or Neshakliers? Neshalskers? Neshaklers. <laughs> So I want to start with uh, Howard uh, Schrut. Uh, he first asked if anybody knows about his uh, uh, family member. I don't know if I'm saying the name right. Nosan Zelmanovic. Uh, Zelmanovic. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm bad. I'm bad. And, um, but he added something else as well. I'm just looking for it. I lost uh, <laughs> the rest of the... Uh, what do you, oh, here it is. Okay, so he wrote that my grandparents, Abraham and uh, Rachel Ne Zelmanovic, uh, Shrut left uh, in 1905. Mm. Uh, she had a brother, this um, Nosan, um, a brother and a sister who moved to New York, and a brother, Nosan, uh, who stayed in uh, Nashlik and is presumed to have perished in the Holocaust. I think what uh, Howard is asking if anybody knows. Or about that, uh, about him, the name. Did that come up in any of your uh, research, Glenn? Well, the name Zamanovich is familiar. Again, this uh, list of names, for example, the business right. directory, they appear there. Um, I, I am grateful to be speaking in Israel. I know that there are very likely descendants from the town. I would say, rather than spending time here um, to go through all of the genealogical connections that I hope we have, I recommend mm -hmm. for everyone, there is a Facebook page called Return to Nashalsk, which is a closed group for descendants. And this is a place where everyone can share information and ask questions and hopefully make connections. We've already had some extraordinary connections. Um, in addition, if you wish, you can email me directly. Um, I'm happy to <laughs> respond to, to inquiries. Right, and I also put up your, um, your webpage so you, you can, people can contact you as well. There are definitely a few more um, people here that are talking about their own personal connections. And I think that's a great way to uh, make the connection. Um, actually, I do wanna ask one question. It's okay, I don't wanna get into the secrets of the book. Really, I, I truly recommend reading the book because Glenn really not only talks about uh, pre-Holocaust, uh, uh, but also what happens during the war. And you gave one example, but there are many examples of how um, other people that you discovered how they survived. So it's a fascinating uh, journey, each one a different journey. Um, but I do wanna ask you about um, the actual uh, film, because when you say that, you know, it was, you know, my mom had thousands of postcards. So I'm saying, okay, you find this film is in the family, but how did it get from the drawer to uh, the museum in Washington, I think that would maybe be one thing that people may be interested in. It's uh, not a very typical story. Yeah, well, like the um, box of postcards in the closet, um, this is a story of closets, I think. Um, I, I don't know what happened to the film between 1938 
and probably 1970 something. Um, I am almost certain it was just sitting in a box in my grandparents' closet, my grandmother's closet. Eventually got transferred to my parents' closet. Um, and um, fortunately, when my parents um, you know, dissolved their, the, my childhood home, the house, and moved to, to Florida, as all New York Jews seem to have to, um, um, they kept it and they, they brought it with them. Um, and it simply sat in a box then in that closet. And, you know, it was, um, this is a terrible way to store film. It's a terrible way to store any important documents. And um, the film itself was in the process of decomposing when I discovered it. And if it had been a month or a couple of months later, it's very possible we would not have been able to recover the original film at all. Um, I donated it as soon as I found it to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, and they spent a great deal of money and devoted a lot of resources to having it digitized and preserved in that way. So. Um, there is one more question about, um, besides the film, was there, did your grandparents uh, keep a diary or an itinerary of their, right? Uh, Nothing. Said, you know, <clears throat> amateur tourists, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's astonishing that no, there's no documentation of this visit. The only thing that we have from this is a, is a handful of postcards that my grandparents had sent to my aunt, who was at you know, summer camp uh, during this time. <laughs> and she saved them. And um, she didn't even know that she'd saved them. It took her a couple of years, literally, to find them buried in a also in her closet. Um, but from those postcards, I was able to piece together the likely itinerary. And that helped me eventually identify the precise day on which my grandparents had, had visited Nashals. Um, um. I think I'll send you the chat with all the uh, people who are, you know, talking about their family uh, connections. But there is one person, um, it's lost because everybody keeps adding now, but someone actually wrote that they're, they're inspired by your research and they're going to go research their family from uh, Riga. What I would like to do now, Glenn, is maybe you can introduce uh, who we have in, the, in our audience today, besides our wonderful audience. There are some special um, uh, participants this evening, so. Well, thank you. Um, it's, it's an honor, and if I appeared nervous during my talk, it's because Mr. Chandler is with us to, this evening, um, and uh, along with his family. And um, uh, Maury, I don't know if you would be willing to say a few words of greeting, um, but um, I, I would invite you to, uh, to say hello. Yes, we hear you. Hello. Good to see you. How do I uh, unmute myself? Uh, you've already unmuted yourself. We can hear you. You can hear. Well, I, I'm just amazed at the interest of people <laughs> of, uh, I would call it a virtual triata mason. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the fact that I'm still around and I'm still uh, sort of working three times a week and I'm driving and I don't know, I don't know where it comes from, but I'm around and, and I'm amazed at the uh, people that are interested in their the history of their relatives and so on. And I was able to shed some light on what, what it is, how I survived, that's a big question. At my age now, I keep asking the same question, how was it possible? Yeah. And the religious would say, Etzba Elohim, which I doubt very much. And I sometimes say, the Etzba missed me. <laughs> because the intent wasn't this, this great. I, I slipped away from the Etzba Elohim and uh, I was able to acquire the Polish language uh, faultlessly to a complete 101% because this is what had to be done to live in, in Polish culture and the village. 
so that nobody had any questions. If I am Catholic, so I learned how to go to church and to go to confession and the catechism, the whole nine yards. So that's what I would call Atspa. I don't know whose Atspa it was, but somebody, you know, and he also, they gave me the looks that, you know, avoided me looking Jewish. And uh, of course the uh, false certificate that came up in question many times, but I missed it. So I'm grateful that I'm here, have a nice family. My kids are all Jewish. I have a little granddaughter at MIT mm -hmm. and she is conducting services in Hebrew. She's half Japanese <laughs> and she speaks fluent Hebrew and runs the show. And this is my, you know, that my, I was always in, made sure that I didn't broke, break the chain of continuity with my parents and my ancestors. And I think I have succeeded. So I wanna thank you all for listening. And I'll say, God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marie. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I mean, I, again, if you read the book, you can learn a little more about uh, Maury's experiences and how he helped Glenn discover so many details. I keep thinking to myself, how many people do I really remember from pictures from my hometown? Um, and it's amazing how much uh, you could uh, contribute to uh, the research. Um, if people are asking how old you are, and I'm... I'm 96 yay. and pushing 97. <laughs> and pushing 97. <laughs> so many people are writing in the chat. Again, I'll send it to you, Glenn, and you can pass it on. Thank you. Thank you for your spirit and for your sense of humor. Uh, um, and thank you again for coming and for being with us and sharing your story and your grandparents' story. And I have the book in front of me with my page. <laughs> <laughs> I highly recommend to, to, to get the book, to read it. Those of you who have been following us. Thank you. Me too. Point. And if I may say also my thank you is I want to thank you and the staff at the Ghetto Fighters House, which has been absolutely marvelous. And the programs that you're doing are so important. Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, I want to thank Maury Chandler and his family for being here today um, and other people who participated in the story for, for being here. And all I can say is that I see myself as really just the conduit. Maury and the other survivors are the people who helped remember this town and remember the people in the town. And because of you and because of your willingness to, to spend time and to work with me and, and face again these, these most awful and possible memories and times, many, many people's names will be remembered who would otherwise have been forgotten. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you again. And so how we say in uh, Hebrew, Laila Tov <laughs> to everyone. Goodbye. And we'll see you in 2021. We all be happy and healthy new year. Come on.